This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 335 for Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Joining me tonight is Brock at Vola, here for a good time, not for a long time. It's been a long time, but you can find him at the Cat Volver on Instagram. And this month, search the hashtag candy of this day for some tasty treats. Brock it, my friend. Welcome back. Hi, Joel. Um, and, uh, I curse you. I will start that <laughs> off right here at the top of the show. Um, if you've been following candy of the state and, and my time on this podcast in the past, Joel has mentioned something called all sorts. Uh, that's how it is pronounced exactly how it's written. I imagine it is. And um, what's confusing about it is that when I was younger, I could never remember the name of the candy when I was an adult, because yeah. when I asked my parents what they were, they said, Oh, they're just all sorts. And it's such a common for, turn yeah. of phrase that I thought, Oh, it's just all sorts of candy. It's just random yeah. candies. Like, so I never <laughs> knew like, where do I find those? licorice things that we used to have when i was a kid and and anyway uh so all sorts is the brand and if you if you go to brockett's uh instagram page you can see a picture of it so that you guys can easily find it and uh, prove me right in the long term but i feel like we might be disagreeing on this find it or more like like you know how to recognize a witch by its crooked <laughs> nose and warts so you may burn it at the stake like that's how i feel about it i mean like I am not a. I I like red licorice. Licorice. Yeah. Um. My dad likes black licorice. I do not care for it, or at least I've seen my father consume black licorice. Right. And so it's been one of those things where I thought, well, maybe it's in my bones. Dad likes Jägermeister, um, and uh, and I always confuse licorice and anise. I believe it's pronounced like the like they seem slightly interchangeable at times, at least in America, as far as like that flavoring. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. But boy, oh boy. Uh, I will give all sorts this, uh, the three types that are in it, which is basically, I would describe like pips, sprinkles all over like a wad mm -hmm. of licorice, which is not black. It was kind of like a, a, a clear jelly kind of. Yeah. The, 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 those ones are kind of like gummy candies and those, those are my least favorite in, in, in the all sorts bag. Yeah. Those are bad. Um, the layered ones, which are like a pink, white, and they almost look like, um, Almost like tiramisu or uh, yeah, kind of like a layered Neapolitan square. ice cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are also very bad. <laughs> um, and then the last one, the round coconut with a tiny bit of their licorice in the middle. That one's slightly bearably bad. Like that's the one. Like if <laughs> if I was like to be gagged with one of these. That's the one I would be able to maintain in my mouth long enough. Right. The, the um, esophagus shaped one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But the thing about it that's interesting is I know some people hate coconut. So that one might actually be a combination of literally like the two worst things in the world. Mm. But um, they are uh, pretty atrocious. I will give it this of the atrocious black licorice variety things I've had over my time doing candy of this day. Uh, they're the best. And a coworker asked me, like, I wasn't quite sure, like, based on your review, if you were pro or against it. I was like, what part of it's the king of the dung heap? Did you not understand? It's all garbage. <laughs> but, like, if you have to eat one piece of garbage, if you have to dig your hands, uh, Dr. Statler style, into that dung heap and pull something out, all sorts is, I suppose, the one you should go for. So <laughs> I guess in some ways I'm saying I appreciate all sorts if you want to wrench for content. Right. But if you look at the content, it's mostly negative. <laughs> well, I will vote that if you like black licorice, which you don't, uh, out there, dear listener, that you will probably enjoy all sorts. Although I'm on Brockett's side in that the sprinkled covered gummy ones are not the best. I li I like the layered ones because I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure one of the layers is like fondant or something. Like it's got that kind of 
icing feel to it. It's so weird. Yeah, it's, it's like a little black. They are gourmet. Sandwich. Yeah, like they're. And I would definitely say that they are. Um, again, like you say, if you do not mind the flavor of licorice, yeah. like I feel like if you're somebody who eats a lot of good and plenty, um, which yes. are these cat pink, disgustingly pink, like Pepto Bismol pink and white capsules filled with garbage black licorice. Um, then this all sorts should be like it's like if somebody walked in with Ferrero Rocher mm. and you were just like just shoving like basic Hershey candy in your mouth like you know all of them are nice but yeah fancy wise all sorts is definitely like I'm UK I'm gourmet I'm straightening my bow tie on the way to my black uh black tie affair yeah Sort of yeah. thing. Well, I well, we know where you fall on all sorts, but anything this month sticking out in candy of this day is something that's like top notch. Uh, top notch. I think of the things I've seen so far. This this um, there's a place in town um, that will not give me any money, but whatever. Uh, Chicago, not that I've asked for it, but a free publicity. There's a place called Dylan's Candy Bar sort of a twist on the idea of a bar and a candy bar, even though they don't serve liquor that I know of. Um, but anyway, they have a lot of different types of candy. So I went in there with knowing what was coming up in mind to seek out rarer candies. Cause I was able to get some good ones last year because of that. And um, basically I was able to snatch a bunch of these. They had all sorts. So as soon as I saw it, it was like a big win. Cause I knew, Hey, misery in a bag. Can't wait to talk about that for Citadel cafe. <laughs> um, so I grabbed that sucker. Um, it's like, yeah, I just, it's such a nightmare scenario, but I would say kinder bueno bars are quite good. They're kind of wafery. If you're aware of kinder joy, which is sort of egg shaped and then you open it up and it's like a weird, you scoop it, make your, and it has a toy inside. I don't know. Those were good. The Bueno Boys were really good. They're kind of wafery and light. You can wolf through two of those really quickly. Um, so far though, I'd say probably the biggest winner is nerds, um, big and chewy, big and chewy nerds, which kind of look like, um, they kind of just look like giant. Like if there was a whole bunch of bumps on the outside of a peanut M&M, but instead of, it being a peanut m and m it's like a nerd mm. uh, where like it it feels really hard like i thought i was literally gonna put this in my mouth and it was gonna shatter my teeth right but like it gave right. just enough hardness before it squished to chewiness and it was good it was like a good soft chewy because that's a that's a key point because when you hear chewy and i did a bunch of them so far this month like big hunk look bar are very much like a chewy nougat where like you're really kind of nomming on it for a while. Mm -hmm. This kind of big nerd chewy was more like how chewy runs are. Some of these things that say they're chewy, but essentially they don't know what else to call them. Like Skittles, like you chew on them and Starburst, you chew on them, but Starburst has way more chewiness than uh, big chewy nerds. So big chewy nerds was a big hit. Um, the one people I shared those with were very pro them. Laura saw my post about it and said, I better bring some home to her or else I'll get out. <laughs> uh, and I did. And the marriage was saved. Smart man. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, those were good. And there's been, it's been fun sort of because I've done this, I guess this will be four years, maybe four Octobers in a row. 31 yeah. candies or more yeah. every day yeah there's a uh, there's so 138 posts out. or give or take uh, when, I, when i when i look when i look through the hashtag this is why i I, yeah. I brought it up um so yeah i would say four years you know with a little extra mm -hmm. you know you're looking at 30 days and i lost so. my first year because the first year i ever did it was just facebook no pictures and no instagram oh okay so really i lost like a whole year of classic ones i think most people have never heard me talk about mm -hmm. Um, I think the first one I ever did was Almond Joy. Well, hey, re uh, retro is in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so. Do you do this at yeah, Christmas time too? I can't remember. No, I've done Easter one year. Easter, I did the days leading up to Easter, and I did Easter candies, um, which was interesting because I was able to eat four different types of chocolate bunny. Um, and, uh, and then I had like several Cadbury eggs and different stuff. Easter is just, there's very few rare just for easter stuff um same for christmas and i thought about doing christmas candies but i really am not a fan of peppermint i like mint's fine <laughs> there's yeah. only so much mint 
I can have. Yeah. And Christmas is usually either mint or nuts. There's a lot yeah, of that. A lot of nuts or, or chocolate. Like or like you know you get the the, yeah. the pot of gold and then you've got like well do I treat the pot of gold like one chocolate or do I treat it like like twelve right like is that one day or twelve days because there's there's exactly. in some of those uh, like Quality Street and Pot of Gold you can get a variety of stuff especially now because like all of those big brands that are struggling to I guess stay afloat in in the you know, larger candy variety that's available to people have all these different skews. It's like peanut butter uh, pot of gold, caramel pot of gold, and dark chocolate pear, you know, pot of gold. And so, like, mm-hmm. you walk down the, the aisle at the grocery store, and there's, like, freaking six or eight different kinds of pot of gold. When I was a kid, there was one. <laughs> it was a black box. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the only kind there was. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I just... But there's... Yeah, I, I I like the I like after eights, so I do like a good peppermint chocolate candy. Um, after eights, yeah, that might be a Canadian what is this, thing. Like risque. Yeah, like that might be a Canadian thing. I'll have candy. to uh, I'll candy. have to send you a, a link to that. Maybe I'll try to find a box. <laughs> Ugh, last time you talked about something, it was all sorts and it was a nightmare. Well, so I, I, after eights might be. Uh, I might have to. It slow is mint. It. I'm telling you right now, it is mint <laughs> and it is chocolate, is it... but it's small. It's like it's like a, the size of a graham cracker. It's like a wafer thin chocolate like mint, york uh yes Peppermint very candy, similar okay. it would be okay. similar but super super thin um the idea is that they're kind of like an after it's not meant to be a, a, a dessert it's more like something that you serve after dinner with like you know in between kind of like a palate cleanser sort of idea oh. maybe, maybe with a cocktail sort of idea that's that's what i've always kind of like a oh, okay like how i picture andy's mints mm. like on your pillowcase yeah you know, so it, well and, fancy, and right? as the name implies you know after eight like after 8 p.m sort of idea like after dinner oh nice That's, yeah, yeah exactly perfect yeah. cool get my smoking jacket yeah. on and eat like 800 <laughs> so anything else i'm looking at a, a couple things i don't recognize like what's what's a no way it looks like a chocolate bar. no way was one i found also at dylan's candy shop and i just felt that that was a good one to grab one because i haven't heard of it and two because it was really interesting in all the promises it was making about what it has it has no way obviously no gluten and stuff but it also eliminated uh eight common allergens including peanuts and pine nuts and um uh i forgot the other one uh milk it looks but like yeah no dairy in it um and so it was it was it, i was like all right good because there's a lot of people out there peanut allergies are are, are becoming more prevalent and more mm-hmm. aware um and i love peanut butter so gosh i mean like i can't imagine the people who are like like do not open a bag of peanuts on a plane type of level. But, Mm -hmm. you know, you want to know if there's options out there for other people. And so I was very intrigued by this bar and it turned out to be quite good. It was very dense. I think I equated it to like flourless cake. If you've ever had flourless cake, which Mm -hmm. can be very like rich and like it's, you know, it's a stiffer, denser cake. And so this was like a, a dense bar, but good and that was nice to know because i guess you know there's some stigma to you know once you like take out real stuff from whatever like you know it's not as good but that's not true i mean you i'm sure everyone out there has somebody who's a vegetarian or vegan friend Mm -hmm. who oftentimes like make a promise of a dish being as good as this other dish which may or may not measure out to be true but it is nice that in this case this was a really good um candy bar so and actually laura's sister i commented that that was really cool and she'll have to look out for them so i i I think she'll probably try and check them out for the her kids because i think they're they're trying to stay away from way uh specifically Mm -hmm. so that's great because you know you want to be able to like experience as many things out there and there's a big craze in america right now for these impossible burgers these no meat yeah i can't remember what brand is in canada but it's either the impossible burger or one other thing and they're just they're like two patties in a styrofoam container and you know um i can't remember the price of them but it was like 10 bucks or something crazy uh it is it's it's almost like i was gonna get one just to try one at burger king i was like two dollars more than beef and i was like well I mean, like, it's not like, I, you know, like, I would like to try it, but at the same time, like, I'm not going to just go crazy mm-hmm. by getting it. But, yeah, I would say the No Way was pretty good. Um, I hit on some that apparently were a lot of people's, like, favorites growing up or or people were more aware of them. These candy bottles called Nick L. Lip. Um, basically, they're just wax 
four little wax bottles, probably about the length of, of your index finger, maybe your middle finger, depending on the size of your hands. And if you bite off the wax top of the bottle, you can suck out basically sugar water, sort of what I would say oh, a, a melted <laughs> a melted ice pop oh, would be God. like. No. Uh, it was, but some people loved it. And to be frank, like, the people who commented on it said as kids, they had like an oral fixation, like they needed to choose something. They like to, to like be um, working on something. So the wax, like, although not something they would ingest that no. much was something that you kind of, you know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, you, you know, it's funny. You know, it's funny, troll. I might go back and eat an entire wax bottle before I finish off one of those all sorts. I'm just going to say, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. The wax to me is starting to look pretty tasty. You know? <laughs> At least it has literally no flavor and all texture, whereas like all sorts had a little bit too much of both. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, uh, speaking of sweet things in your life, I I have to tip my hat uh, mostly to to your wife for sharing the video, but um, uh, your daughter Emerson is, mm. is now toddling around. Uh, is mm -hmm. pretty much the cutest thing ever. She's got this <laughs> ridiculous you. grin. Uh, there's a couple of, I mean, as people are going over your candy of this day post, they'll undoubtedly find pictures of Emerson scattered around. Uh, yeah. She rules the roost at the moment. There's a really cute one, in a, and it looks like a little mouse or a little bunny hoodie or something. Um, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. But the other day, I've, I've had a very busy week. Uh, high stress, get ready for Hellcon in a, in a week and a half. And I just had a long day, and I was tired. I was on the couch, and I was checking some Instagram messages, whatever. And I came across this story post from your wife. And she's coming back from the bathroom and she can't find Emerson or she's pretending to not be able to find Emerson. And Emerson is sitting on the carpet with a bucket over her head, like a little, <laughs> a little purple plastic bucket. And your wife is get is right up next to her. Like Emerson, are you there? Where are you? Hello. And she's, and, and Emerson is like committed, <laughs> committed <laughs> to yep. you cannot see me. I am not here. And it is, I mean, it's an, it's an old, it's an old joke. Kids do it all the time. I lost my crap. I was laughing so hard. I couldn't see, uh, to finish the story. I had to go back and watch the rest of it later. Like it, for whatever reason, it just absolutely tickled me. And then Emerson lifts up the bucket and looks at your wife. Like it's like the most, she is not even laughing. She's just like, no, 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 I'm not here. <laughs> like it's, it is deadpan, deadpan stuff. She must get that from you guys because. Because <laughs> man, yeah, I mean, you and Laura to me are both pretty dry in terms of your your sense of humor. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I I just I have to tip tip my hat. Uh, I I really enjoy the the stuff that that you guys share, and it's weird because in a in a world where you know, I'm over forty, a lot of my friends have kids, and a lot of my friends do nothing but share stuff about their kids. But for, with you guys, there seems to be this balance or this entertaining thing where it's not just like. The stuff that you're sharing is usually pretty nerdy. That's why I bring it up on the show is that there's usually some sort of tie in. <laughs> there's some sort of thing that's just like, you know, these kids, these parents are nerding out about their kid. They're not just doting or gloating or bragging. Yeah. Like there's just, there's always some sort of nugget of like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is really funny. It's not that like, I'm just feeling like posting about my kid today for no reason. It's like, you can tell that you guys are just as tickled by, by what's going on. But, but anyway, like I'm, <laughs> it's really fun to watch. People that I've known for quite a while now and have never met, you know, be, mm -hmm. like you and I, um, but we work together on, you know, a monthly basis on the show and just to see the growing family and to watch her toddling around and, and uh, watching her personality develop via social media. It's, it's, it's such a, it's a cool, but strange world that we live in, you know, where I know so much about you guys, but yet know so little at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, uh, it's, it's cool. We, uh, we love, obviously we love um, uh, our daughter. We love taking pictures of uh, her and videos and we capture stuff. And I mean, you really do like before Emerson, it was the cats mm -hmm. um, and the cats still, I sent two pictures of the cats tonight before the show, but like, um, so our phones are pretty dominated with cat and baby stuff. But of that, we probably only post about 10%. And of the 10%, it's definitely some curated stuff where, like, we're just like, oh, my God, I can't. Like, like Laura sent that to me, and it was just hilarious. And then 
I think she uh, she posted it a day later, but we were just talking about it and just like, I can't believe it. Like some of the stuff Laura's able to capture and also some of the stuff that just Emerson does. I mean, like children all, you know, children and animals will surprise you all the time. Mm-hmm. And when you capture that perfect moment, like it really is sort of like this universal moment of like, oh, like, you know, like you enjoy it. And so we try and um, we try and share that. And other times we're just like, oh, my God, just look at this freaking baby. Like, we just love her so much. And we want to appreciate her as much as possible before she starts saying words like, I hate you and uh, <laughs> get out of here. And uh, you're boring. Like today, yeah. you know, Laura sent me a picture, a video of Emerson. And she's really, really into opening drawers and emptying everything out of them. <laughs> so uh, my bedside table has a bunch of stuff. And uh, she also has is not into hats per se, but she does this motion like with the bucket. With well, the bucket, it's easy to get on her head. With other stuff, she takes it and she like wraps it around the back of her neck. Like she imagined that was like just the act of swooping it over her head was going to put it on her head, where instead it just kind of rests behind her neck. So she had grabbed some apple earbuds um and like had done that and so they were resting on either side of her her shoulders but not on her ears or anywhere else Mm -hmm. um but just kind of sitting there and she was doing stuff and like i was like oh my god she's already one of those kids that just wants to put in her earbuds and ignore mom and dad she was just (laughs) she's moving around and walking and like not paying and laura's like emerson say hi to dad and she's like not looking at the camera not responding and it's like there it is Get her, but she's like ready to like hate her block. Like she does not want to, <laughs> does not want to roll with mom and dad anymore. So oh yeah, 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 you know. yeah. When you're going on, <laughs> going on, going on fourteen, yeah, oh, fourteen months. She's just the worst. Oh yeah. man. But uh, uh, and it's and just the sweetest kid though. Um, really has been really great um experience so far. So. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward we to the adorable uh, the adorable Halloween pictures. I'm sure will be will be coming up soon. Yes, yes. We have some we we love Halloween. It's a big deal uh for us. We got our decorations up probably right before October started. Um and um and anyway, uh basically uh Laura did a great job and decorated the house and we got stuff everywhere and so like with the candy of this day and then the Halloween and then you know just the the weather for the most part i'm okay with as long as it's not too rainy um <laughs> it's pretty great it's it's like a great time of year um i was telling co-workers that i think probably halloween's my favorite holiday in general it's definitely my favorite um, time of year like october yeah october into the first you know a couple weeks of november depending on usually september and as we did it's usually when we get a lot of bad rain and hurricanes and stuff like that we'll have a break for october and generally there will be some heavier weather come in november but um, as long as it, it usually doesn't happen until later in the fall, but fall is my favorite time of year. I'm a little bit disappointed uh, with how busy I have been lately. I've had to work the last couple of weekends and it means that the hikes that I wanted to go on this fall, uh, and take in some of the leaves changing and, um, some of that stuff that happens a little bit sooner outside the city, uh, I have not had a chance to do. So it's been a little bit, a little bit on the frustrating side, but, uh, I've also noticed yeah. that, uh, with the amount of work that I have to do when it's a little bit chillier and it's, uh, pouring down rain sideways, it's a lot easier to be inside and be doing video <laughs> editing or, you know, client work or something like that compared to a, like a sun or sunny Saturday. If I'm going to work, it rained all weekend here. So at least if I'm going to work, it can pour outside. That's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. If I'm going to be stuck here. Um, but speaking of uh, work, we actually have uh, some listener email for the Citadel Cafe, which is so rare. I like to put it at the top of the show. Uh, if anybody out there wants to send in a message, by the way, it's the Citadel Cafe at gmail.com. It's super easy to, to remember. Uh, it's also linked on our show notes page. Uh, but uh, this one comes from Cosmic Dancer, who some of you in our Discord might recognize. Hey, I hope all of my favorite geeky podcasts are doing well. As I've been under the weather the last little while, I've been looking for things to listen to, and today decided to listen to a few episodes of the Citadel Cafe. What a nostalgia trip. She went all the way back in the archives. One of the things I noticed that you guys used to do is a little section for music, and I've got to say, I really enjoyed being a lover of podcasts and music. Is this something you would ever consider uh, covering again on the show as I'd love to hear some more music recommendations. Stay geeky, Sarah, AKA cosmic dancer. Uh, thanks Sarah for the, for the awesome email. Um, I unfortunately don't listen to a lot of modern music. Uh, most of the stuff I listen to is like classic jazz. So I may not be the best person. So I usually defer to guests on the show. So do you have any, any music recommendations for, for Sarah? I will Rocket? try and do you, I will try and do you two. One, 
geeky and tied in. I don't know if you ever got to the soundtrack portion of things when you discuss Into the Spider-Verse, but the soundtrack for Into the Spider-Verse is quite excellent. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, so if you want to check out some cool um, current hip hop R&B music, that was really good. Um, obviously, if you saw the movie, you heard a lot of it, but it's it's it, that's a really good soundtrack. Um, and to stay on theme, um, I personally love to curate uh, playlists in my All Hallows Eve playlist. Some of these also are songs I just like besides the Halloween-y stuff. But if you ever listen to Biggest Fan, my old defunct podcast back in the day, I used to play a lot of Hey Ho on the Devil's Back by Cats and Jammer, uh, an all-lady band. Um, and that's a really fun song. It's also kind of spooky and stuff like that. Uh, and I also highly recommend, um, there is, well, I was trying to pull this one up and I couldn't get it fast enough. Um, uh, there's, uh, well, I mean, there's tons of like classic horror stuff, but then I find that like, if you take certain songs and you just sing it just right, like Lana Del, oh my God, this is funny. Cause the last time I was on the show, we brought up Maleficent and Lana Del Rey does a version of Once Upon a Dream from Sleeping Beauty, the Disney film mm-hmm. for the new or the first Maleficent film. And it's haunting and really good. And I like it quite a bit. Um, it, it's the best thing to come out of that movie that shouldn't exist. And now there's a sequel, which I think <laughs> you and I can both agree is uh, is uh, pretty baffling. But mm-hmm. hey, you know, they make money off these things. And, um, and then also, uh, if you ever saw The Hunger Games, uh jennifer lawrence in i believe the third film of the third book but the first half of it um mocking jay i believe sings the song the hanging tree um there's actually another version of it by angus and julia stone uh, which is a haunting version of that song which i really like if you like something a little bit more beat but kind of a twisty sinisterness i and you love the beatles like Maxwell Silver Hammer is about a guy who just keeps killing people with a hammer and it's really upbeat and perky. And <laughs> so it's like really enjoyable. Um, so I highly recommend that one as well. Um, and if you want another funny one, um, uh, especially with Rosh Hashanah just, and Yom Kippur that just passed, um, and you can stand Tracy Morgan uh, and you love uh, Childish Gambino, 30 Rock did a a sort of joke song called werewolf bar mitzvah the full version of it is quite funny um it's uh it's uh it's i found it through spotify but it's called werewolf bar mitzvah and uh that's another funny kind of more enjoyable one but i highly recommend i every year i search for the best halloween songs and just see the same ones over and over again you know thriller monster mash obviously um psycho killer by talking heads gets brought up a lot but then you know you'll find fun ones like Jonathan Colton who did um, uh, if you're familiar with the portal games uh, I believe he wrote uh, the original still alive and um, uh, now I want you gone I believe he wrote those songs Mm -hmm. he's a song called uh, re colon your brains like you would sing an office memo like a reply memo Uh, it's basically a zombie talking to his co-worker in an office building it's uh it's pretty funny Uh, (laughs) so those are all just some random little like highlight stuff um i could go on and on but definitely definitely uh a great time of year to enjoy both you know some creepy stuff and then just some stuff that's like more macabre but with like a a fun little twist to it nice uh i I don't have a lot of music uh, to recommend. Uh, The only pop music or or current music I listen to is on whatever satellite radio is playing at the gym uh, because I don't work out with headphones in on the weight room floor. I do on the treadmill, but I'm usually listening to a podcast. And so they have the same rotation at the same time of day when I'm ever I'm there. So it's the same 12 songs that I keep on noticing. So uh, (laughs) I find myself like humming Bad Guy by Billie Eilish in the bathroom when i'm home going like why do i i don't even like this song <laughs> it's not <laughs> bad it's it's not a bad song it's just not my kind of thing and but it's it's an earworm like it definitely gets gets in there um and i think it's probably because i hear it like a couple times a week at the gym um 
But uh, in in lieu of uh, music, wh- why doesn't Joel listen to music? Well, I'm usually listening to podcasts. Uh, it's, it's kind of been ruling my my earbuds for the last several years. So I have a few recommendations I can pass along. I don't do this often enough. I don't uh, pass along the podcast love to other um, podcasters that I like often enough. So I thought I would take the opportunity. Uh, this one is short lived and local. It's called Party Lines. I've mentioned it on the show before. It's a Canadian political podcast. It's hosted by Rosemary Barton from CBC. Uh, I would check that out if you were at all um, following the Canadian election right now and, and looking for some information. It's a nonpartisan podcast. They just kind of like go over what happened. They try not to get too opinionated. It's not too editorial. They kind of explain why things are important. And they do that for all parties, including, you know, different the different parties you may or may not be interested in hearing, but I find it's a nice fast way to get up to speed. It's only about a half an hour every Thursday. Uh, other news, I like the Phileas Club. That's by Patrick Beja. You can find that over at frenchspin.com. And uh, that's a monthly show. Patrick brings in a bunch of guests from around the world, and each guest brings an international news show uh, story and a local news story from their country. And so they talk about that for the better part of, I think, 90 minutes or so. Uh, it's a fantastic podcast, and it's an easy listen because it's only once a month. It doesn't add a lot of listening time to your regimen. So it's the kind of thing that I tend to pop on, like, that weekend when you get a lot of laundry to do or, or something where you, you're doing cleaning around the house, I find it's usually a good one to listen to. Uh, as far as daily shows, I like the Daily Tech News Show. That's with Tom Merritt and uh, hosts, uh, and they do that Monday to Friday, uh, except for holidays. And that's, of course, as it sounds, daily tech news. So Apple, Google, Facebook uh, legislation, but also really cool stuff in like medical tech, uh, robots, drones, uh, AI, a lot of news in, in AI and uh, re- recently VR as well. So that's if that's something you're interested in, you can always check that out. Uh, Patrick, who's on Phileas Club, is also one of the hosts on Tuesdays, I think, on Daily Tech News, news Show. So you might see some cross-pollination there. Uh, speaking of Patrick, Pixels is a gaming podcast that I quite like. That's every two weeks. So again, light on the listening uh, in terms of your time commitment, uh, but uh, good on content. Uh, they usually wait for enough news to be out there to actually make a show. Uh, so then Patrick, Patrick and uh, usually a guest, and it changes from, from week to week, uh, will cover gaming news uh, for like... PC gaming, console gaming, sometimes mobile, but mostly they focus on, on, we'll say, we'll call it like the hardcore gamer stuff. It's stuff that you would be interested in if you would consider yourself a gamer, which I think a lot of the mm-hmm. people that listen to this podcast probably are kind of, kind of, kind of runs with the, the geeky folks. Um, I would consider myself a niche gamer. Like I have a couple of video games I've got time for, but not, I don't play everything, but I still find the show interesting because it kind of covers an industry that I'm interested in, but don't really have the time to partake in. So it's a nice way to keep up yeah. to speed. Um, and last but not least is a comedy show that was recommended by uh, Johnny, my co-host on the Spun Chunks. It's called Ear Biscuits with Rhett and Link. They're from Good Mythical Morning on YouTube. It's a morning show. Uh, and uh, I don't listen to that as often. It's kind of at the bottom of my roster, only because I have so many other things that list- I to listen to like on the daily. Um, but it is very funny. Uh, these are two guys that can basically tell you a story about going out to dinner and still have it be extraordinarily entertaining. And not that anything really eventful happens. It's just the lens through which they see the world. Uh, and uh, I find them very, very funny. And it's a nice light listen. It's something that you can kind of have on in the background while you do other things. So those are my those are my top podcasts right now. Have you listened to any of these, Brockett? Have you check them out no i am i'm familiar with tom Merritt. um he's his name's drifted to me um but no not none of those generally i when i was working at a job where i can listen constantly i was grabbing every single podcast i could get my hands on everything from frog pants to like Mm -hmm. just all over the place like npr in the states like everything they put out everything um and since then i just do not i just i rarely listen except on the train so usually in the american football season i listen to a lot of american football stuff nice um uh but the podcasts i recommend are usually very thematic um uh, it's become more and more popular. And again, I, I'm just going to beat Halloween to, to death. Ha <laughs> ha, laugh about it um, <laughs> here. But uh, Lore, L-O-R-E, is about a bunch of folklore throughout the world, mostly creepy stuff. Uh, that's an excellent podcast. Um, and I've heard uh, that of that before. I think maybe Megan has mentioned it on the show. Somebody has brought it up. 
but that's it's quite not good. the first time someone has recommended that show yeah it's um if you uh that one's pretty good oh that just reminds me of something i want to add later in the show um uh but uh and then i uh, one that i really recommend and they're can i'm pretty sure they're canadian unless i messed this up but i'm pretty sure they're canadian uh dakota ring theater uh, is a podcast that I used to listen to a bunch and I really love what they do, which is just, they make new, but old timey serials like radio serials. And, um, uh, and one of the characters they've done for years is the red Panda, which is basically the creator's version of the shadow. Mm -hmm. Um, but also blackjack justice, which is a noir, um, with Trixie Dixon, girl detective, that one's awesome. Uh, and really great voice actors. Um, and they've done that for a while. And, um, and, uh, so much so that the, the writer creator of, uh, of the whole podcast has also been able to go off and make books about these characters, uh, as sort of his like projects and stuff like that. But that's really good. Um, I highly recommend that show whenever I get an opportunity to recommend a podcast, cause they just seem like they definitely do it right. They have the sound effects. They, they do, a really great radio drama. Um, and I highly recommend that one as well. If that's something that's interesting to you, you can, I, they usually archive everything. So you can go back all the way, all the way and listen to like over a hundred episodes of both those types of characters and even some other characters that have kind of come and gone over the years. Nice. Uh, in fact, he started to do a new one, I think, which is like a girl, like a Nancy Drew esque character, which I've not started to listen to because again, I just don't keep up. Um, but, uh, but I recommend that decoder, ring theater uh is that podcast and lore is the other one uh for more spooky stuff cool well in the essence of time i want to get into what we've been what we've been watching and consuming but there were a couple of uh news stories that i wanted to touch on very very quickly i'll keep it brief uh in montreal a couple of weeks ago uh half a million people marched in a climate strike uh including uh greta turnberg who is a pretty world famous activist at the moment and uh i just it was just cool to see that kind of turnout at home here in Canada. Uh, I was going to attend the one here in Halifax, but I wasn't able to that day. So I did my best on social media to try and tweet out and share information and just kind of like do what I could from my desk that I was unfortunately shackled to. Um, but the, yeah. uh, the, the article I have from CBC said an estimated half a million people uh, in Montreal other articles I've, see, I've seen said it was the largest in the world. It's certainly the largest in Quebec's history. Um, but um, the, the, as other marches are being, um, the turnouts of being calculated, I feel like it, it might have, it was the largest for a while and then some other country kind of beat them out real quick. But either way, uh, the amount of youth uh, doing climate marches and climate strikes in the last couple of weeks has been astronomical and i just thought it was worth worth a nod and worth um something to pay attention to considering again i live in a country that's doing a federal election in the next week uh so i thought that should be you know front and foremost in at least some of the oh, things that sure. i mentioned on the show um, but on a lighter note uh both of these stories came in from uh, my friend alistair who was kind enough to send them along um the first one which i think is, is something that i'll just i'll touch on uh, is that uh, marvel's kevin feige is potentially going to develop a uh, Star Wars movie for Disney. So yay, uh, I'm on board for that. This is the guy that's responsible for most of, if not all of the current um, MCU that we have all grown to love over the last few years. And hot on mm -hmm. the tail of that set of, uh, article is the fact that Kevin Feige has been named chief creative officer at Marvel. And people are like, well, that's he's already a big wig at Marvel. How's that news? No, no, no. He, was the pre he is the president of Marvel... Um, cinema or studios, studios or whatever, yeah. which handles the movies. He is now yeah. the chief creative officer of Marvel. All of it. <laughs> Print, nice. television, uh, animation, film. Mm -hmm. He is the, the top dog. Uh, and previously, I think it was Joseph Lowe or Joe Lowe uh, was, um, was in charge of things like uh, Daredevil and Luke Cage and the Defenders and a couple of other things. And all of these six uh, television projects have been canceled <laughs> in one form yeah. or another. Uh, and so with Disney Plus coming, with things like uh, The Winter Soldier and The Falcon coming, uh, and now Kevin Feige kind of in charge of all things creative uh, at Marvel, 
it gives me some deeper long-term interest in Disney+. Plus. I feel like there's going to be more for us nerds in the future. And so we'll have links to those articles uh, going over the details. But those are essentially the exciting bullet points. And I, it's all good news for me. Like I, as far as I, I can tell, it's been a very long time since a movie studio like Marvel Studios has been putting out films where I will just go see it. I, I don't even ha- question it. I will just like, they're all good. I like them all yeah. in various degrees of like, but I always like them. So, uh, what about um, Pixar? Do you feel that way about Pixar too? Uh, I know some people have I felt used that way to. in the past. I used to. I think, yeah. Okay. When they started doing the sequels is when I started to go like, eh. Okay. Uh, you know, like I'll skip Cars 2 and 3. Incredibles yeah. 2 was good, but it was nowhere near the first one. Toy Story 4, didn't even see it. Like I just, you know, but then there are other things like Coco. <laughs> you know, and oh, inside yeah. out oh. that blow your mind. So what yeah, I've exactly. noticed, what I've noticed with Pixar for me is that it depends on who the director is. Yeah. If it's like not, Pete Doctor yeah. Or some of if it's not a sequel and it's, a, and if it's a uh, Pete Doctor or Andrew, Bird, Andrew Stanton, I think he, Andrew he, Stanton, he did Wally. Yeah, Nemo, Nemo and, and Wally. Wally. Yeah. So like those, those uh, are the ones that I'm just like, okay, you know, no, ears perked up. Like I'm, I'm there. So yeah, well, yeah. well, I'll, I it depends on what's what's going on there, but uh, but I only right. say that because Marvel and Pixar are now under Disney's blanket. Yes. So mm-hmm. uh, Disney definitely has uh, um, really stepped up. I I don't mean to jump ahead. I see you've mentioned Disney Plus in the show notes. I don't know if you discussed it much in the past. Are you? Pete, uh, very intrigued by Disney Plus. Were you like on the fence and you're moving closer to it? Is oh, uh, to I've always been very at? interested. It's it was just a matter of when and how much. And since the last time we talked about it, I think the price point has come out, which I believe is it's under ten dollars Canadian. Way I believe it's like six ninety nine American. Six ninety nine American. I know. So it's probably so. nine ninety nine for us, and that's cheaper than Netflix, which is currently thirteen ninety nine. Canadian yeah. uh, and yeah. the amount of stuff that I don't care about on Netflix like I just I can't find the stuff I like for the sea of crap that I've never heard of is <laughs> is in a different language or is at the yeah. moment yeah. is mostly either Korean dramas or Chinese stuff and it's all fine I'm sure it's good for the people that like that kind of stuff but it's not mainstream in Canada we don't get the same kind of content that you get in American Netflix the copyright stuff does yeah. not cross the border very well so um, with Disney plus just being Disney and Marvel and Star Wars and just everything under that umbrella, uh, as well as ABC and, um, and all the old stuff. Yeah. The old stuff too. Right. So I'm going to have, I'm definitely going to be subscribing for the first couple of months. I also feel like I will be canceling Netflix at that moment. Cause right now, uh, because of the computer that I'm building, I have, uh, been using Amazon prime. Uh, and most of Amazon Prime Video, is ter- in terms of the Amazon original content, which is to me the most interesting, is available to me in Canada. That's something that's mm-hmm. nice about all of these services, is that anything that they do that's original, that's made by the streaming service, is available worldwide. It's the other content that they're licensing that tends to have different copyright restrictions and region locking and all this other kind gotcha. of crap, which makes no sense whatsoever, considering that it's yeah. 2019 and we live in this digital age. But anyway, I won't go on that rant. Um but for now, I've been enjoying a lot of what's been on um, on Amazon Prime. So to get into what Prime. we're watching, uh, I uh, to get this out of the way, because it's, it's short and I can't talk about it too much because there are spoilers in it. Uh, the Crystal Calls, The Making of the Dark Crystal, Age of Re- Resistance, is on Netflix and is very interesting. It's a great 90-minute documentary. The interviews were a bit repetitive, so it's, it's more about what's happening when you watch it as opposed to what people are uh-huh. saying. Uh, there's a lot of great in, in, artistic insight from Brian Froud, who's of course the artist that designed a lot of the characters and, and the look of um, of the Dark Crystal and and a lot of the other Henson films in his own worlds, mm-hmm. of course, as well. Um, what I really was tickled by were the talks from Lisa and Cheryl Henson, who are Jim Henson's kids, uh, talking about the Dark Crystal and how it was their dad's kind of baby like it was his it was yeah. kind of his 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 renaissance kind of film and how they were really cool and and they were really what's the word i'm looking for excited that netflix was happy to be pushing the puppetry like not trying to get them to do cg at every corner 
Um, oh, sure. They were, yeah, yeah. Netflix was very much about the craft. And that that's the only thing that about this documentary that falls short and repetitive is that I don't know how many times you can sit there and listen to someone say how wonderful it was that this was so artistic and that was so uh, so much about the puppets and so much about the craft and everybody was just so excited to work on it. Every single person on camera says that. It's it's so it it does eat up a good chunk of <laughs> a, a chunk of the of the documentary. But for me like while I'm watching the documentary I'm looking at like the maquettes in the background and the sketches on the wall and you know the the process of putting a skexy costume puppet on like so there's a lot of stuff that I thought was was interesting it's still, mm-hmm. for the 90 minute documentary it was it was certainly worth worth the time um obviously you can't watch it unless you're okay with spoilers about the actual age of resistance series so watch the series first and then and then go back and watch uh, Crystal Calls. I know, I know we have to, to keep things moving, but did you watch the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance on Netflix at all? No, we, I, again, the last time we, I was on a show, we did Pass or Play, and we brought up, uh, and we both agreed Maleficent was a needless film. Mm-hmm. Um, I just got to bring that up again. I just don't understand this film. Uh, and now that they have a sequel, it just blows my mind. Um, like, is she mean now? I, she was supposed to be the good guy. I know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I, it's, I, I just, I can't, I can't help myself. Um, I'm not a dark crystal fan. Mm-hmm. I did not, when I saw it, I'm a labyrinth fan. I love labyrinth. I'm all about labyrinth, but I cannot, I saw dark crystal. I think maybe at an age where part of it, the Skeksky, Skeksky's, whatever, scared me a little bit they're a little creepy and elements of it and maybe if i rewatched it i know people who are just like gaga over it particularly uh, um in my age group and i mean i love jim henson stuff and i love a lot of different i just never got into dark crystal so as soon as it came out that i think that and evangelion were two big big like nerd things that came out recently and both of them were like big fat like raspberry noises mm-hmm. for me like i'm just not interested in whatsoever um, so the but, age of resistance, know, the, the new series on Netflix, the pace of it and the content would be closer to labyrinth than, okay. than the original dark crystal. Is there a cool, is there a, a like a guy in a big cod piece who gets to sing cool songs? No, that's awesome. Like, that's oh, not, nothing to that. The, the, no Jennifer Conley. No, and, there's no uh, Jennifer Conley. There's no people. Oh, there is no human that's... characters in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. dark crystal. Sure. Um, the, the thing, the uh, thing about the original movie, and I went back and I tried to watch the original movie and it's not that, like I didn't like it. I just ended up not finishing that session and I haven't sat down to finish it. Uh, mm-hmm. whereas the dark crystal age of resistance, I, I could not wait to watch the next one. Like I was pacing it one a day, uh, okay. and, and trying to get through it. And so, um, yeah, I, I I'm would, I would, I would give it, I would give it a shot and you don't necessarily have to have, go rewatch the film first. It, it's, it's a, it's a prequel, but you know, like Ugh. it's, it's, if you've seen the movie once, then you can go back and watch the age of resistance and you don't have to worry about it. You, you can kind of just get the Skeksy bad guy, Gelfling, good guy, you know, magic stuff happens. Man, yeah. Man, like just, yeah. yeah. I do hate prequels, but yeah, I guess since I don't remember the original film, it doesn't matter because I won't know where it's no, going. <laughs> and the thing, and the thing about this prequel is that they set it so far behind, like it's so far in the past that there's enough of a there's enough of a shift in everything from the eco uh, the the ecosystem to the, the 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 history of the planet, like everything in in the like for example the prequels and stuff like that, and the sequels in the. Um, Star Wars universe, they're dealing with like within the lifespan of characters, right? Like yeah, grandfathers, yeah, yeah. sons, and and grandsons. Whereas this is like thousands of years. Like it's like it's just it's generations uh, pass, and 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 information is lost between the Age of Resistance and and the uh, the Dark Crystal. So it's it's worth going back. So, um, but the other thing that I've been watching and quite enjoying, although you've got to be in the right mood for it, and this is an Amazon Prime discovery of mine. Uh, I've heard about it. I've always wanted to check it out. And until I had my, my prime free trial, I had no opportunity, but I really quite enjoy American gods. Uh, have you seen this at all? Okay. So I listened to the audiobook, okay. uh, which was a full cast. It was fantastic. Um, Neil Gaiman reads parts of it. Um, if you've never seen, if you've never read the book, um, I don't know what I could talk about without ruining parts of the show so i'll just be as vague as possible i enjoyed the book i will say net and it's funny because good omens just came out and i'm trying to watch that now on on prime as well another spectacular cast 
Um, but when I read Good Omens and I listened to American Gods and the times I've absorbed Neil Gaiman, he is a fascinating man and a really great writer. Something just doesn't click for me. There's something about like how he builds towards, I guess, a climax or the way his plots are. They're less archy and more meandery and that's totally cool and that makes a lot of sense but to me um there's a little bit more like i'm a big like and then at the end like you know harry potter at the end of seven books like there's a big you know it builds to this massive like big battle climax that's sort of me um and so uh so american gods as a book was really fascinating i love the mythologies they go into mm. i looked up so many of them because there was a lot of them were obscure to me yes um because they're from so many different uh countries and and people and and past and present and future sort of you know it's fascinating and the cast looks amazing so um i hope that the show's really great um how do you feel about it so far so it's one of those programs that I have to be in the right mood for. It's okay. it's dark. Like it's not a happy show. There are okay, funny like Breaking Bad. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There are funny moments. Most of them come from Mr. Wednesday uh played by Ian McShane, who I could watch oh, read yeah. the phone book. Like I mean, I oh, really I really the 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 charisma that he brings to the character in the screen is just is really really good. Yeah. Um and really, I mean, Ricky Whittle who plays Shadow Moon is also good. He's not playing a happy character, but he, you know, um he's still very good in what he does and he is your lens. Like he is experiencing these gods and, and what's happening around him and mysticism and spirituality and stuff like this for the first time and trying to, he's having to pinch himself and saying like, did that really just happen? Like, did I really just make it snow? Did lightning really just strike that person? Like all this kind of stuff. So he's kind of like your, he's serious because he's the reality. He's the lens through which you see all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's a dark show. Like people die violently and they, yeah. you know, they, they're, it's, it's an, you know, it's an, it's a streaming service show. So they don't have to <laughs> pull any punches. In some ways it was more gory than the walking dead. And I'm like, Oh wow. I didn't need to see the wow, person's inside on the okay. outside. Like, I mean, it's not as grotesque, but it just, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't leave much to the imagination where you kind of wish it would. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Stuff like that. Also very sexual. Like there's a lot of nudity and there's a lot of like, uh, like yeah. old world, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm not sure what he even means. Blood, and, blood sex. and sex and, and violence is like, it's this, pri it's very primal, yeah. I guess it's a good, it's a good way to describe it. Which uh, is realistic yeah. to sort of when you read about that stuff, but at the same time, like in the post you know, HBO Game of Thrones yes. era. You're like, does it, we really do we really need like 500 people naked in the background? Exactly. When the conversation exactly. About dogs. Like yeah, that and that's and that's the thing that I find it's um, it's not in a way it is gratuitous, but it's it's not because it's very it's usually not presented usually not presented sexually. It's the nudity is usually violent, so it's 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 this weird sort of thing where it's not necessarily tantalizing it's mostly meant to make you feel uneasy and it achieves that uh so yeah. you know you you, you you can see the purpose um it's a painfully slow show but for whatever reason i still yeah. can't seem to stop watching it so it it's got something that i can't quite put my finger on um i will very often only watch half an episode just because i'll be sitting there going like wow this is this must be getting to the end and i go to pause it and i'm like halfway through like you're not you're yeah. not even at 30 minutes you're like okay i'm not finishing this whole thing right now there's just i'm just not in the mood to have this kind of sensory overload for this length of time um yeah in a way though when you're in the right mood at the end of an evening and you want something to wind down and it's not action packed like it's not going to blow your speakers it's not fast cuts it's usually really slow really artistic like it, the, the, the everything that they do long bits of cinematography with no dialogue either just music or sound effects or something uh have a purpose and you really can't look away there's so much visual uh symbolism going on that you kind of mm -hmm. have to pay attention um and they the juxtaposition of the soundtrack talking about music uh cosmic the soundtrack to american gods is phenomenal 
uh we're talking yeah. like they it's it's everything's kind of like midwest kind of like scenery so they're t- you're talking about like johnny cash folk songs really obscure stuff that's yeah pitted up against like tales of coming to america where they do a flashback from like the 18th or the 19th century or something like right that. and then you're listening to a track from the beatles Right. Yeah, so like, yeah. you expect it to be some sort of classical music to kind of evoke that that era, but then they don't. They grab like sixties rock, you know, and they put that in, yeah, exactly. they put that in the in the shoplifting scene or something or, or in the in the jail cell. And you're just like, Why are they playing like why are they playing Elvis Presley in the jail cell? Yeah. You know, so it, it really does work. But some of those old, especially that country folk like Johnny Cash, like that's some grim stuff. And when that stuff happens in and around some of the 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 more violent actions like it's for whatever reason it just has that cowboy wild west feel to it having yeah. but doesn't look the part in the least um so i really really enjoy it and i mean in that way it it creates this battle zone for essentially the old gods and new gods so there's these older gods which is all the uh, mythology that you and i were talking about the stuff the obscure stuff that no one remembers uh, and these yeah. new American gods and the new, the new American gods are high tech and weird yeah. and they have short attention spans. Like it, there's a lot of comments on modern culture. And so, um, oh, sure. yeah, like I don't necessarily like all of the actors. I mean, Gillian Anderson's in it, uh, and she does really well, but she plays a, who'd she play? Um, mm-hmm. I can't remember. Uh, uh, she, she, I don't, she an I, American guy. she's an American God, but I don't remember the name of her God because they don't ever really say it um oh yeah she, media, she plays she plays media, media. okay so i was about to say yeah as soon as you said her i was like i wonder if she's uh she's media yeah so at media appears as a different iconic character so she's playing mm-hmm. she's doing a bit character uh you know a bit of acting every time she's on screen she's pretending to be mm-hmm. marilyn monroe or from my love lucy or you know or, I love lucy. Yeah, or something yeah. else and so you're not really getting to see necessarily her top dramatic acting chops what you're seeing is her top kind of like mimicry uh parody Mm -hmm. so over the top it's meant to be grating like it's not she's not bad in terms of like it it makes you think oh god this is terrible it's like she's over the top corny on purpose like it's that the that's the whole point uh, of yeah, of she's media. playing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she's meant to. She's meant to be as plastic and as 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, fake, v- fake and, and vapid as possible. And, yeah, yeah, like you just there's no substance. But she does Big that so well. She's style. empty. Yeah, yeah empty. Yeah. Uh, and so, but then you contrast that with like you know Ian McShane and and um and and Ricky Whittle and and those characters are are like real people. Like they have they have a little bit more. I mean, Ian McShane is less. He d- he doesn't have any um fear. <laughs> so there's there's no you, you don't really identify much with him. He's just entertaining. But but um, Shadow Moon, you're just like okay, like he. Things scare him, things startle him, things surprise him. Um, th- all that kind of stuff happens. You feel the emotions through him. Um, yeah. So he's really weirded out by media, and so you are too. That sort of thing. Um, but everything, like everything else, is is good. I, I really, um, I really do recommend it. It's just that you just you have to be in the right mood. So there might be some visual triggers because, like I said, it's pretty graphic. Just an FYI. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's a well-produced show. My gosh, did they do a good job making it. Um, having yeah. not read the book, I can't compare how it holds up narratively, but uh, enough people that I'm friends with and have the same kind of like nerdy tastes with uh, like the show. So uh, take take that with, uh, with a grain of salt. But I, I would at least recommend checking out the first. You'd have to give it three episodes, I think, before you'd be really hooked. But How are you watching it? Uh, I'm on a set-top box, Apple TV. I just, I have a okay. prime, yeah. prime app. Yeah. So it does make sense. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was trying to wonder, cause I was trying to find it and I was like, no, nah, it's, that's a, I'm like, my hands are tied by streaming services at this point. Mm-hmm. So some of them I have access, some I don't. It's, I, you've actually talked me into wanting to watch it because I, it's one of those things like, so I wasn't, I read all of series of unfortunate events, the books and was deeply, deeply disappointed in, in them. And I was in college when I read them and they're not meant for me initially, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I would argue they're not necessarily meant for children, children, but whatever. Um, and then when the TV series come out, I was enjoying it. And I would say that I enjoyed the TV series more because 
with time and some other narrative licenses, they were able to get more out of a story. Um, so maybe the television show would be able to do that. It's one of those things though that always scares me because HBO is doing this a lot. Well, tons of TV shows are doing this. The first season is like a book, but then like there's no follow-up book. So if you were watching Big Little Lies season one and then you were disappointed in season two, well, there was no book for season two. And right. the original writer wrote a novella because they wanted to make another season. And I've not watched that second season, but people were disappointed. And that's the reason why. So I do know there's some extended universe for American Gods. He gets into some of the other characters and some other books. Um, so maybe they're able to pull uh, in that manner um, from well, it. But to... it definitely seems interesting. To get into at least uh, a point of reference, the last thing that happens in season one, and this isn't a spoiler because I won't reveal exactly who uh, says what, but Mr. Wednesday reveals who he really is. Okay. So it takes wow. the whole I season. How many episodes? Like is season 10, one. I think ten, eight or ten. Inter- fascinating. And so now you Did know you why it's suspicions? so slow. <laughs> oh, I, I figured Did it out suspicious? right away. I figured it out oh, right, right away because I, I kind of I like. Uh, myths and mythology and i'm familiar with the book oh, for sure. lore. so i i I, yeah. I was thinking well i i, I want to say like i figured it out right away then i had some doubts later on because of the obscure other gods that they were mentioning and i was like i don't know who the hell these right. people are so well maybe like maybe i'm like i was right in terms of the kind of god he was uh but yeah. i was in but i was and i thought i was correct thought i was incorrect and then realized i was after all right the whole time in terms of who he was. Get back, but yeah. that's the last thing that happens uh, just to kind of give you a point of like where, where that is in the book. So for anybody is there that, a famous landmark, you don't have to say which that's involved. Uh, when that yes. Happens? When that happens, it is at a dinner party, a, a large party in the springtime. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a, one of the best parts of the books. And then the foreword to the audiobook, Neil Gaiman talks about why he wrote the book and all this sort of stuff. Um, and it is very fascinating because he says that I tried to as much as possible write about, the roads, the roads I drove on, the music I listened to, and the places I visited in as much and accurate detail as possible. And when you Google image the places he talks about, they're there, and the ways he talks about them are essentially exact. So it makes this extra layer of fascination that America has <laughs> just some really dumb, weird things out there mm-hmm. that are landmarks. And in the era of highways, which has now been... Uh, obliterated because of interstates in America. Um, you have all these back roads that are no longer as viable, but there are so many other ways they were trying to draw your attention and draw people to them. And so there's all these interesting little places and, and they get into it on the show. I would imagine that sort of the way America is, as a country, these sort of landmarks and special spots, the world biggest yarn, those types of things suddenly kind of become almost religious like sites yeah no it's precisely yeah uh at one point uh because the way that it works shadow moon is essentially a driver slash bodyguard for mr wednesday and Mm -hmm. when they're traveling uh shadow moon tries to take the straight road the interstate and mr wednesday gets really pissed off not pissed off but he gets he gets loud and says no 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 we never take the freeway we always take the back road always the back road like he was very adamant about like we don't go the main way we go the old way um, which yeah. is which makes sense once you kind of figure out more about what the story is going on, things like that. But yeah. uh, in the essence of time, we got to move on to to what you've been watching, and I know that you've got some some spooky uh, points of interest for people looking to um, watch Spook some ho- some horror stuff leading into Halloween. Yes, so I'm just gonna kind of pass or play these um, in the sense that I've seen them, so I will tell you whether to play them or pass on them. Um, just a bunch of stuff. It's funny because we talked about so many streaming services. So I've tried to say which services I watched them on. Um, but again, I do know that that means some of them will not translate um, uh, over country lines. So I'll some I'll try and say if they're originals or not. The first one I have is In the Tall Grass, which is an original movie by Netflix, uh, created by or well, sort of written and came from the brain of um, Stephen King and Joe Hill. Um, they also did some other ones. Um, another one I'll get to, um, down the list here, but, uh, just came out. It has Patrick Wilson in it. If you know him from Watchmen or Angels in America or various other TV shows, um, he's fantastic in it. The rest of the film is just not good. It's very bad. Um, basically very interesting, great 
concept. There's these really, really tall grass, sort of like corn-esque height grass, just grassy bits on the side of this road. And these people on the interstate highway, whatever, this small road, get drawn into it. And then they're kind of stuck there because it's this ethereal sort of place. And it's creepy and it's interesting. It's a lot of the concepts and moving pieces in it do remind me of a lot of elements and themes and tropes that come up in Stephen King's stuff. Um, so there's some stuff there, but overall the execution is not great. The acting is just okay. It's for Patrick Wilson. who's great, um, but not given a ton. Um, there's a few striking visuals that I can't really get into, even though I would spoil them just because the movie's not good enough. But um, uh, needless to say, I'll just say they're on the opposite side of this small road. There's this church and you see a bunch of cars parked outside of it. Um, and you don't really know why. Uh, and uh, at one point, a character who drives up towards the grass on one side and the church on the other side goes into the church. And inside the church, all the stained glass it looks like with the light reflecting, like you're inside uh, grass, basically. The stained glass is green tinted, so it's this green wash all over the church. It's very interesting. Um, that's a nice visual thing. Um, and that would be one of three things I would mention that was good about the movie. So uh, I would pass on that one. Um, uh, I know your buddy Lou probably is well aware of this film, but it was new to me called Train to Busan. Um, it is a older film, I think probably about, about like a couple of years, three or four years. Um, basically zombies on a train. That's really doing it a disservice, but that's what it is. Um, and I don't really want to, like, it's not blatant that it's going to be zombies, but it's sort of blatant that it's going to be zombies. Um, and I would say it had some really great performances in it. It had some new ideas for zombies I haven't seen before. Uh, and the fact that it's happening sort of in a train setting uh, was really good. So it, that got me quite a bit. So I would definitely play that one. Um, not actually, also not super into the gore as much. People get bit, but it's not... It's you're not going to spin like four like 14 seconds straight if somebody's juggler getting ripped out like you see in a lot of zombie things. Yeah, now. it's like we get it. Like they're scary. They bite people. Let's keep the focus on the momentum and less the gore. So that's good. Um, the body uh, on Hulu. So Hulu has an original set of um, spooky horror films, um, and I forget what it's called. Into the Dark is their series of them sort of an anthology series, but it's, they're all movies. I only got to the first one, which was about a hitman who kills a, a, a guy and has to get the body from one part of town to another part of town. But he, through circumstances, it doesn't have the same mode of transportation that he needs to. Um, and it's on Halloween night. So as he drags his body through the streets, people think he's dressed up. Um, the guy who plays the hitman is actually pretty good. I kind of like him. And the general jokiness of it kind of plays out well but overall it's just okay so i'd say pass um there's these short short shorts six two to six minutes each netflix um series called don't watch this and just don't watch them none of them are good <laughs> uh short and sweet um a movie that came out recently and the d writer director just came out with a new one called midsummer uh, but the one before that he made uh, called Hereditary, uh, which you can find on Amazon Prime uh, if it crosses the states because it is a it was a wide release um, with Tony Collette, Gabriel Byrne. Um, really good, really good horror film. Uh, not for the squeamish, um, but also maybe not for the um, psychologically squeamish. It's it's a, it's real. Like afterwards, it was enough a thinker. I googled a bunch of stuff to read about. Did I see what I saw? Did I understand what I thought I understood? And there was parts I even kind of missed and stuff. It's it's good. I really recommend it. The, it's one of those that the least you know, the better, I guess. But just generally know there's a family sort of that has a weird history, a family history. And they're just sort of in a weird spot. Um, and the events that occur because of that. Um, so I would play that one. Um, probably one of the best horror films that I think straight up horror films from the past like five years. Uh, I've brought this up before Netflix, original uh, cartoon anime, whatever you want to call it. Castlevania based on the, the game. I love it. I love this show so much. The first season was only four episodes. So I was like, Oh my God, this is going to take like 40 years. And then the second season was eight episodes. And I'd almost say like, 
at this point, if they do another season, great. If they don't, fine. But like, it was great. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, Richard at not at Borough. Oh, I just should have looked him up. Uh, basically, the king under the mountain a dwarf uh from uh the hobbit and he's been in a bunch of different stuff um uh if you just look him up you'll know him anyway he does a voice of one of the of the main people and if you're a big Battlestar galactica fan uh guys baltar again i'm usually better with people's names but uh he does a voice as well basically they're hunting dracula some that's the gist of it if you don't know what castlevania is about if if you did see the if you did play the game um, I'm told there's elements of it that, you know, the Belmont family, Dracula, that's all there. Um, you know, there's less jumping platforming in it because it's an actual story, but it was great. Uh, so I'd play that. Um, Richard Armitage, the, I think is who you mean. Richard Armitage. That's it. Yeah. Yes, he is. He's great. He's the voice of Good uh, actor. Trevor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does really. Oh, cool. he's, he's one of these guys that when you hear him, he's like, oh, geez, you know, he's this <laughs> gravelness to him. And when like his character is like really put upon, um uh because he's like been besmirched over the years as this fallen house of, of monster killers and uh so he's always constantly like mm, you know like sort of that sort of i stuff. didn't dislike the hobbit series it wasn't necessarily my favorite next to the lord of the rings but i i watched the lord of the rings pretty much yearly but i don't return and watch the hobbit as often as i probably should i might no. re- i might revisit that this uh, I, just, I really like smog <laughs> Uh, yeah sure you know, like i really there's so just watch those scenes. yeah try, i mean it, it's the kind of thing where i might not sit down and watch the whole thing but i just you know yeah. I, I certainly want to go back and revisit it i mean at least the production value in the world is there and and the, i did enjoy the dwarves like you know i i don't oh, sure. i don't enjoy the cartoon trip down the river on the barrels but <laughs> you know but <laughs> which was in the book yeah, so it's, it's like in the book but it looked job. it looked terrible you know it looked yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so th- those are the it's... kind of things that pull me out of it i don't have those moments where i get pulled out in the lord of the rings for whatever reason oh sure you know um just i think better. lower tech like they had to do more they did more practical stuff but at any rate yeah uh giant aside um lou also highly recommends castlevania so for anybody that's looking for like a double recommendation um i haven't seen it yet I, it's one of those things i just haven't got to um but uh, oh god it's so much fun two out of just two fun. out of four hosts of the citadel cafe uh highly recommend it Who's the fourth one? I need to work on that person and get past you, Joel. Oh, Once we uh, get three Megan. out of four, <laughs> I'll get her. Yeah, I'll get her. She she loved uh, Hill House, I believe. Uh, I and she loved. Um, I think she's watched uh, the current season on Prime that you're watching. What's it called? Um, oh, Good Omens. Good Omens. Like she's watched that twice, three times through. I think. Fantastic. She's amazing. <laughs> she agrees. Uh, just retroactively, Castlevania, do it, Joel. Um, Apostle is another Netflix original film. Not good. Um, Dan Stevens from who's great. I love him as an actor from uh, Downton Abbey and the new Beauty and Beast. He was the Beast, um, but he was also in a horror film. Horror film uh, called The Guest, which was actually kind of fun. Uh, he's fantastic. I love him as an actor. Wasted in this really bad movie. Like Michael Sheen's in it too. Speaking of good omens, also a great actor, wasted in this film. The concept's interesting. This like weird little cult on this small little island that his this guy's sister went to, so he wants to go find her uh, and kind of rescue her and get her off this island. Great concept. Lots of interesting things happen in it. Could not be have been more frustrated without that film. It's one of those films where like halfway through, you're kind of just like, I really hope so many of these people get murdered horribly because I don't like them and I hate them and I don't like what they're doing and I don't like Mm. how they're acting or how they're treating other people. It's just one of those things where you get so frustrated with other people that you're just like, all right, fine. Just start hacking them all up because I don't care. How I feel about the boys. I, I, (laughs) two or three episodes in and I just, I, I cannot get myself in the mood to, to get into it. Like I understand it's a well done show and there is a appeal for some people for that audience. I am just, I don't think I'm that audience. I'm not a Garth Ennis fan who did the original, and I really dis. I love superheroes. I lo- Superman's my favorite superhero. So why would I love a series that's basically like superheroes are all jerk offs? Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, they're also jerks, and they should be taken down to peg. And I'm like, why? Who gives a crap? I love them. Like they can still be flawed, but they'd be interesting. I don't need a bunch of people to tell. Like I hated the movie Wanted and the original comic. I also disliked, though the comic concept i thought was a thousand times better than that movie the movie was just really bad 
um, in my opinion. But I've always made this joke. I, if your movie needs to tell me, like, if your movie's like flipping me off and saying I'm so cool, then guess what? You're not cool because I can turn you off, or I can not pay you, or I can do whatever because I'm the person who's consuming your your stuff and your trash. Mm-hmm. Like, don't try and tell me that you're awesome. And I always felt that way about. Um, like the boys and certain things like that. And like, that's, and that's the thing. Like I've brought up the other Amazon prime uh, shows that I've been trying to watch uh, things like uh, carnival row, carnival row. I like it. I just, for whatever reason right now, I haven't finished it. Cause it's also dark, but not, yeah. not in a bad way. It's just like, I have to be in the right mood for that kind of stuff. But oh, sure. Carnival Row, unlike the boys, doesn't beat you over the head with anything. You have to pay yeah. attention. Like there's all these subtle parallels between our society and our world and, and this fictitious world in the show. But they just, they mention it in passing. And if you're not paying attention, then you're not going to get the subtlety of the show. I love that. It's an intelligent show. But and I think that's, yeah. what, that's what the boys come down to is that it's, it's not an intelligent presentation of what could be a an interesting concept and they just they go for the they go for the the low-hanging fruit too much you know yeah Yeah. jesus um uh if you have a a good stomach uh a a lot of documentary series called dark tourist is quite good it's got a new zealand host with a bit of a, a wit to him and he basically he goes on dark tourism places it's a thing i had never heard of basically when people are tourists but they go to places that are sites of murders or they go to radioactive fields that are like open to the public or one of the places when he in his japanese (laughs) episode he goes to um the very famous suicide forest right um uh so places that have like a macabre or war zones or but he goes through all this stuff honestly he goes through way more like war zones and radioactive places than you would have thought um that they let people go into it's crazy um but you do have to have a a a good stomach for some stuff there are there is some animals that are harmed in certain episodes so if that is something that you're against like my wife stay away from southeast asia asia as an episode entirely um but there's only eight of them and i think his wit i do not like travel shows or documentaries very much but this combined enough things together that made me interested so that's on netflix this original series um i recommend that i would play that one uh 1922 with tom jane Another Stephen King movie for Netflix. God, it's so awful. So definitely pass on that one. Uh, and uh, It Comes at Night, I finished today. Uh, I'm going to pass because I just don't, I don't understand it. Like, I mean, like, I understand it. It's just at best it was mediocre. At worst it was boring, I guess. Like, mm-hmm. I just, it didn't do too much. Like, thematically and film-wise, it was well done. Impact-wise, I was like, I'm like I guess it was it had tension and I felt tension throughout the whole thing, but then like it didn't mean it didn't feel like it meant anything or it did something to me. Uh, something like Hereditary, which you constantly have like some freakiness and tension, and some like am I seeing or thinking what I'm thinking? Like that is a really well done movie. So um, I would pass on It Comes at Night. Um, I feel that's, like that's oh, the the feeling that I get with most Netflix original content. Uh, no longer is it really? is it like ooh Netflix original that's probably good. It's I have to wait to see if other people think it's good. Uh, most of the Netflix originals I see are in the lines of In the Tall Grass, nineteen twenty two. You know, it yeah. comes at night. Like the and the thing is, like they're the kind of things that. They're still. Oh, it comes at night is not original. I should say. Sorry. I'm sorry. That was. Yeah, I saw it on Prime. But yes. But the but the but, but the, but the, the feelings that they get is that you you can't make that decision until you've invested you know thirty or forty minutes mm-hmm. into a two hour film and you're like yeah. oh god like I just I hate I used to really really hate not finishing a movie but a lot of the movies that I would watch would either be things that I've seen already or have actors in them that I know are really good. Um, but I find the streaming, uh, situation now, uh, I will very often just shut something off and not return to it. And I still have this old mentality of like, I'm not enjoying this. Like, why have I not shut this off yet? I've been watching this for 45 minutes and I, I'm getting, I guess, better at being like, Oh no, you don't see a, 
Um, yeah. And I mean, and then of course the problem there is that I have to watch enough of it for Netflix to go, Oh, you watched this. You might like these other six things. And I'm like, Nope, <laughs> none of those. They all look the same. No, thanks. Yeah. And, and this is the, the issue that I have. Whereas other things like the, the few shows that I I've seen on Amazon prime, um, if I've not watched them, other people have, and they come highly recommended. And even though the boys, I don't think is for me, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's a terrible show because it isn't like it, it has an audience. And for the audience, it's very well made. Lou loved it. And, and I think yeah. that the problem with, uh, the Netflix originals that I'm, I'm hearing is that in general, almost everyone I talk to <laughs> is just like, no, not, not good. Or yeah. rather they're not talking about them at all. Right. The, yeah. the, you know, they'll, they'll come out. Like I remember way back when house of cards first came out, like that was a big deal and people, and it was a good show at first. Uh, and, and I think Great. that, you know, that's missing from, there's so many original Netflix things happening now that I'm not seeing anything rise to the top. So, yeah. But anyway, uh, we should move on into the internet minute, which is going to be a short one this week. But if you are wondering what the heck is this? This is the part where we thank the Citadel Cafe patrons, the people that support the show. We are 100% listener supported. You can find out more at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Currently sitting at 18 patrons. Would love to make that 19 or 20 before November hits. So if you're interested in doing that, you can join the Discord chat where we talk about nerdy stuff all week long. Uh, and there's a number of other benefits uh, in there as well. But that's at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Uh, this week's Internet Minute is brought to you by one particular patron, and that is Cosmic Dancer, Sarah. Uh, there is a uh, another tier on the Patreon, and she snagged it, and so she gets she gets the shout out this week. Uh, and in the, I guess, spirit of fall storms, uh, this storm chaser has turned two years of 4K video into an epic montage of real lightning strike footage, and this is bananas you really have to watch oh. this short film by dustin farrell he's uh, the filmmaker and it is shot at 1000 frames per second it's Ooh. ridiculous the power of nature showcased in this short film which is like two years of footage is just jaw-dropping like because mm. it, it's not special effects like this is yeah. real storms you know chasing across the american midwest sort of thing unbelievable footage uh and and if you've got a big monitor a tv or something like go full screen turn it up <laughs> and, and and enjoy it is just crazy and uh this is from uh petapixel uh i don't remember what social media um uh group I, or I found this on, but there's a couple of animated GIFs kind of like in, in the article that will give you a, a very clear idea of what you're going to see, uh, but a lot slower and a lot cooler with some some artistry behind the, the, the editing and the filmmaking. But uh, but yeah, check it out. Uh, it is called uh, Transient 2 by Dustin Farrell. You can find it on YouTube, uh, but also we'll have a link in the uh, in the show notes. That wraps up this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can find more info about the show and links to um, as many of the things that I can come up with that Brock and I talked about today uh, on the <laughs> citadelcafe.com. The music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email us like Sarah did at the Citadel Cafe at gmail.com. Send us in your favorite music and send us in your favorite podcasts. I'd love to hear about that. Uh, find us by name on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, you can subscribe on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything I'm doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes my illustration and design portfolio. If you'd like to hire me, then just drop me a line there. I am going to be at Hellcon this month. That is at the end of the week, or sorry, end of next week. And um, that is the 25th, 26th, and 27th of October. Uh, I'm going to be doing a couple panels, I believe, certainly one on Minecraft on Sunday. Uh, the schedule for Hellcon is posted on their website. I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, I may or may not have time to do another episode next week. So if you don't hear us uh, from us again until Halloween, that is why. It's because I'm busy. I'm a busy little bee. Uh, everything else that I'm doing online in terms of podcasting can be found at thespawnchunks.com. And you can, of course, follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram at Joel Duggan. I've been doing a lot of streaming lately. I just did an art stream today. So check it out. That's twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan. Brockett, where can people find you and Candy of this Day online? You can check out on Instagram, the Catvolver, hashtag 
candy of this day all one word same for facebook and twitter i've been trying to link it to the twitter but it's the same thing the cat vulva and hashtag candy of this day you've been listening to the citadel cafe where we are fast easy and cheap but you can only pick two